great British explorer, George Mallory, who was to die on Mount Everest, was asked why did he want to climb it. He said because it is there. How on earth can this three pound lump of tissue give rise to the vast complexities and capabilities of the mind? Just think about it. This is capable of composing an opera. It can debate the fundamental principles of democracy. It can even invent tools that allow us to see into the deepest corners of space. Even more profoundly, the human brain can invent tools to see and study itself. In fact, all of the uncharted territories that we'll learn about today are explorable because of this, the human mind. When President Obama launched the Human Brain Initiative in 2013, he said that understanding how the brain works is one of the greatest scientific challenges of our time. Right? It's the moonshot of our generation. And it may end up being a little bit harder than landing on the moon, given that there are more synaptic connections in a single human brain than there are stars in our Milky Way galaxy. Around the world, neuroscientists are trying to crack the neural code to understand how this gives rise to the mind and to identify therapeutic solutions to devastating diseases like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. If we have any hope of meeting these challenges, we need the best minds at the table and in the lab inventing radically new ways of seeing, probing, and understanding the brain. And that's what I want to talk about today. So this is a famous photograph taken at the Solvay Conference on Photons and Electrons in Belgium in 1927. Uh, the 29 attendees that you see here include scientific luminaries like Einstein, Schrodinger, and Heisenberg. When I first saw this photograph, I was struck by two conflicting sentiments. First, I was amazed that such an assembly of brilliant scientists whose work really shaped the world we live in could be gathered together in a single intimate meeting of the minds. But I was also disappointed at the people that are implicitly missing. What do you see when you look at this photograph? <laughs> of the 29 attendees, 28 were men of European origin. Only the famed Marie Curie broke precedent. And while these 29 attendees compiled an incredible list of scientific breakthroughs, one can only imagine how much more would have been accomplished had women and ethnic minorities been allowed greater access to their ranks. As the Harvard paleontologist Stephen Jay Gould said, I am somehow less interested in the weight and convolutions of Einstein's brain than in the near certainty that people of equal talent have lived and died in cotton fields and sweatshops. Now today, most science departments are more diverse than they were in 1927, but not by much. There is still significant progress to make. This graph shows the percent of female faculty in various departments at Harvard University in 2017, where give or take four out of five faculty are men. Now this is a pattern that's reflected in the hallways across academia. And in the interest of time, I won't go through the long history of explicit discrimination that's kept women and minorities out of higher education. Other writers and scholars have chronicled those uncomfortable parts of America's past. Instead, I want to take a step back and examine the implicit biases and stereotypes that can impede girls' access to STEM from the very beginning. What does a scientist look like? Well, generations of students have been asked this question. In 1970, 1%, less than 1%, of children who were asked to draw a scientist drew a woman. Today, about 30% do. In another study, children were shown a picture of a man and a woman and asked to, the point, asked to point to the most intelligent one. Now, four and five-year-olds are m most likely to choose their own sex, bless their hearts. <laughs> but by age six and beyond, girls are more and more likely to choose the man. And girls who endorse a gender stereotype about brilliance are more likely to decline playing games that are described as for really smart kids. These biases are affecting children's choices 
at heartbreakingly young ages. And over time, these are the kinds of early social developmental drivers that can lead to the underrepresentation of women in STEM. And more bad news before we get to the good news. <laughs> For the students and the educators in the room, it doesn't stop at graduation. So this is a recent study um, that was just published where researchers sent fake applications to science faculty around the country. This is for a lab manager position, which is often a springboard into MD and PhD programs. Now, these applications were fake, although, of course, the, science, the faculty didn't know it. And in fact, they were identical, except for a single word at the top of the page. The first name of the applicant was randomly assigned to be male or female. What do you think happened? Male applicants were judged to be significantly more competent and more hireable than identical female applicants. And when pressed to come up with a starting salary, females were offered $4,000 less. This isn't the result of a few individuals with antiquated attitudes. This is the result of widespread implicit beliefs. And here's the crux of the problem. Advocating for diversity in science is not just a social justice issue. It's not just the right thing to do. Diversity in science makes science better. It drives innovation, it challenges the status quo, and it can change the very nature of the questions we think to ask. Here's one example. So the biomedical sciences rely on animal models to understand disease, to test therapeutic treatments, and to advance knowledge of basic biological properties. What you may not realize is that this research almost exclusively relies on male animals. Mm. That fact was discovered by Annalise Beery when she was a postdoctoral fellow at UC Berkeley in 2011. Now, she had a hunch that this was the case, but nobody had ever quantified the breadth and depth of the problem until she came along. She did an exhaustive literature review. She published a groundbreaking report that documented what is now referred to as the sex bias in basic science. So essentially, she shows that across the biomedical science there's an over-reliance on male animals. This is true in neuroscience, it's true in physiology, pharmacology, immunology, cancer biology, and it's been true for half a century. It's even true for animal models of human disorders that are more prevalent in women, like Alzheimer's, anxiety, and depression. This bias has compromised the health and safety of women in ways we are just beginning to understand. Last year, 18 of the 20 drugs that were pulled from the market were done so because of adverse effects in women. Effects that might have been discovered had that preclinical testing included both sexes. What's at stake here is not just the health of women, but the health of our economy, which is suffering from the enormous debt of supporting spiraling healthcare costs. Here's the good news. Beery's work started a movement and by 2016, the National Institutes of Health, under the leadership of Janine Clayton, rolled out a series of mandates to ensure that future studies are balanced by sex. This had an enormous role in ensuring that men and women get the full benefit of our research efforts. And it's not lost on me that women played a critical role in this paradigm shift. Beery saw something that nobody else saw. She challenged a convention that had been passed on for decades. And in that moment, she made an indelible mark on science. I'll end with a, an example that hits a little close to home. It comes from my own field of cognitive neuroscience, where a major driving question is what happens to the brain as it ages. Now, the convention in my field has been to take a group of 65-year-olds and older and to compare their brains to a group of young adults. And to be fair, this has made you know, an incredible amount of knowledge has been generated. We've learned a lot through this approach. But it's worth noting that that number, 65, is a historical artifact. Right? It's based on the average retirement age of US wage earners. It's not based on biology. There's nothing magical that happens at 65. And you could argue, from a woman's health perspective, that it's an absurd age to choose because half of the world's population goes through one of the most profound neuroendocrine changes of her life in the preceding decade, right? Menopause. 
A third of our lives as women will be spent in these post-reproductive years, and yet we have relatively little understanding about how this decline in hormone production shapes the brain. And this is especially troubling given that by some estimates, women are at twice the risk of Alzheimer's and other dementias. So my lab at UCSB is studying this midlife transition to understand the normative changes that happen in the brain during this uncharted decade. So here's the, the ultimate case for diversity. Scientists cannot answer questions we don't see. So a field like cognitive neuroscience that's traditionally been led by men, it's likely that menopause was never visible. Just like it didn't seem strange to only study male animals in the lab until somebody comes along and questions those ingrained assumptions. So what are all the other questions we can't see because we lack the experience to even imagine them? Science has to represent society, especially because the bulk of our funding comes from you, from taxpayer dollars, right? We need a pool of scientists who bring radically new perspectives to the table. And if history is any evidence, when women gain a voice and when we step into positions of power, it transforms science. I can only hope that when future generations look back on a photograph of the most influential scientists of the present day, they see a group of faces that more faithfully represent our social makeup as a whole. And if they do, I think our moonshot will be in reach. Thank you. Mm-hmm.